Drodzy Państwo, ja mam ogromną przyjemność powitać teraz na konferencji Scena Jutra naszego gościa specjalnego, panią Sarę Ellis. Please welcome, I'm very happy that you're here with us. Sara jest dyrektorem do spraw rozwoju nowych technologii w Royal Shakespeare Company i została wpisana na listę najbardziej wpływowych osób w dziedzinie gier i nowych technologii w 2013 roku. Jest również producentką spektaklu The Tempest Burza, o, której, o którym to spektaklu zaraz Państwu opowie, także zapraszam. Three years ago, we spotted that 2016 was going to be a big Shakespeare year. It was Shakespeare's 400th anniversary of his death, and the Royal Shakespeare Company needed to put on something pretty spectacular. We needed to try and match the magic of Shakespeare's imagination. So I got cast a long time ago for this new production of The Tempest, and the RSC is the home of Shakespeare. Not many actors get the chance to do things like this. It's taken the best part of two years for us to develop this technology with Intel and create an avatar to make Ariel fly, to create a sense of the island being a place where magic was possible. I boarded the King's ship. You get to see two fully-fledged performances, one of which is an actor, and another is this apparition can fly around the space. To dive into the fire, to ride... We have unlimited versions of Ariel. We're able to change his form in many different ways. We are creating for the first time on stage, real-time, live facial performance capture, and that is quite an extraordinary leap forward. I and my fellows are ministers of fate. The actor both becomes the marionette and the puppeteer at the same time. And you can see their physicality completely driving one-to-one -one this digital character. Men hang and drown. We keep working, keep trying to refine the way that Ariel moves, the way he talks, and I have no idea where it's going to go. The technology that Intel deployed here for the Tempest is big. Take real-time information from a motion capture suit, map that on to a complex digital avatar, and then project that digital avatar out through 27 projectors. We have their desktop i7s to take marks, skeletal information, and a machine called the Big Beast, which has 120 cores. I've never seen a technical setup like this. This place is full of huge amounts of technology, much more so than most film sets that we're on. Generally, on set, you might say, let's fix that in post. You can't do that here. The avatar has to be so robust because that's the final product. All you can do is create the play with the tools that you have now. And what's delightful about this production is that we have pretty spectacular tools. Shakespeare's vision, inclusive of all that magic, that wonder. The possibilities of what Intel have allowed are only limited by our imaginations. We're at the forefront of something that other people can take on and build. Who knows where things will be taken in the future. It's for other creative minds to see what we're doing and take it further. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, apologies for speaking English today. I wish I, I'm afraid that um, lets me down a bit. But I am Sarah and I'm the Director of Digital Development for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And the video that you just saw was from our 2016 production of The Tempest. Um, 2016 is quite a significant year in the Shakespeare calendar because it's the 400th anniversary of his death. And so it was unquestionably a big year for us. And we wanted to look at 
Shakespeare, past, present, and future. Um, the Tempest is Shakespeare's last play. It's his most innovative and magical play. And to look at that play through the lens of the 21st century and what this play means to the future audiences was really at the heart of what we were exploring here. Um, this is our home. Um, this is in Stratford-upon-Avon. And um, every evening, about a 1,000 people, like here, your theatre here, will gather around and have a shared experience. Um, and it is those plays and those shared experiences that matter to us. So going back to The Tempest, there is a scene in The Tempest um, called The Mask. And the mask in Shakespeare's days were these scenes of spectacle and innovation. The king commissioned design, the best designers, the best theatre makers for these spectacles that often happened one night only, um, cost a huge amount of money, um, and were moments for designers to show off. And in the, in the Tempest, there is this scene. And it often gets cut. It's really problematic. It doesn't move the story forward, and it's a big challenge. Um, so Greg wanted to look at our stage and go, what would a 21st century spectacle look like? Um, and that's where this collaboration started. And what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is just talk you through that process, talk you through the collaboration, talk you through the technologies and what we explored. Um, but ultimately, for all the firsts that you see on stage, there were about 100 firsts backstage and in the company and that's really important to remember that what we were achieving on the stage was really significant but this has changed the way we think about how we can make theatre and look at the new technologies that we can bring into our theatre making toolkit um, that artists and creative can use in the ways they want to um, and I think it's also important to say that theatre has always had a relationship with technology the printing press has allowed us to keep those plays that Shakespeare wrote for over 400 years ago and has allowed us to, that it was a technology that has allowed us to do that. But candlelight is a technology, candlelight change form in theatre. And the brilliant academic Jim Shapiro, um, who is a, one of the best Shakespeare scholars in the world, has said Shakespeare wanted the biggest, the best, the most in fashion. And that's where we're starting today. So to look at what a 21st century spectacle would look like, um, we went to the internet. Um, and I found a two minute YouTube clip um, by Intel, which was from the Consumer Electronics Summit in Las Vegas. Nothing to do with theater at all. And they showed a demonstration that was a whale here. And then on the, on the video, it just came out across everyone's heads. And obviously, you couldn't see that unless you had a screen. It was augmented reality. But I sent that to Greg, and he wrote back, I want one. So to, um, to get one, I had no contact at Intel. So I wrote to the customer service website. And two weeks later, got a reply, which, is, which was great. And we invited them to Stratford. And in that week, we started to explore the, the mask, the scene. And, you know, these are scenes from Shakespeare's day where we still don't quite know how they technologically achieved what they achieved. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I think there's something really important about the magic of theatre. And sometimes we don't know how those wonderful artists and technicians created what we see on our stages. But there were also notes from those spectacles that were really wonderful to, to, to look at, which was... Um, could all the audiences wear their jewels and mirrors so that it will flicker and reflect against the candlelight in the performance? And that just strikes me of wearable technology, just different languages. And that something really important here that the creatives 400 years ago were doing the most wonderful things with the technologies they had to hand. And that's why the past, present and future is so important to us. But in that week... Um, with Intel that, um, coming over to see us, one of the engineers said, do you realise we have enough processing power now to render a digital avatar in real time? And no joke, uh, we just went, that's lovely. have no idea what you mean. Um, and he said it again, and we were like scratching our heads, and we went, 
digital avatar in real time. And, and then suddenly he went, oh, you mean puppetry? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we mean puppetry. And it was the different languages that we had with each other. But it was from that moment that we turned from the spectacle and that scene to the character of Ariel. And these are just a couple of pictures from the past and our present Ariel, who you saw on stage, of what we achieved. And we started to look at this beautiful, wonderful character in Shakespeare's play. We don't know if he's a he or a she, human or nymph, tra absolutely transforms in the play to loads of different characters. And suddenly we went, let's play with that character. And this is where we started. This is our home, Stratford-upon-Avon, and we looked at how we could make Prospero's Island within that. And this is Sylvia and Stephen starting their journey on designing Ariel. Because what we needed to do, we didn't have the tools in-house around the technologies that we were looking at, so we had to invite the people we needed who, who had the superpowers that we didn't have. So we then reached out to the Imaginarium, um, a company set up by Andy Serkis that lead the way in motion capture, particularly on film. You'll know his work very well, Gollum being the prime example. Um, and we needed to learn how we t were to make a digital avatar in real time. And these are technologies that we hadn't used on a, in a live performance before. We needed to see how they converged and worked in that. And this is Stephen Brimson Lewis, who is our director of design. And this is Sylvia from the Imaginarium. Now, Stephen is one of the most experienced designers we have in the UK theatre scene. There's nothing he hasn't done. And this was a massive opportunity for him to just explore his craft and practice. And Sylvia has been used to designing characters on these screens or on this screen, but she hadn't ever before had to design a character on a 40-foot moving surface of mosquito net. And I can tell you now that the design is so different because the scale of the moving means that it, you don't need that massive CGI pixelation. So we were looking at the style of that as well. These two got incredibly close together. And like I said before, our terms puppetry, their terms digital avatar, had, we had to get the language right. And as much as we're talking about the new technologies, what we're talking about is how we communicate as well. And this is the first design of Ariel. This was our first moment where we met Ariel. And there's a really wonderful story here where in the play we have Ariel flies. And in, um, we were making Ariel in a games engine and then to be created into a motion capture uh, workflow. And we used all the tricks in the book about how you make a character fly. We had someone hold him. We had people on chairs moving about. And it just didn't look right. And then Stephen said, should we just get rid of his legs? And everyone went, what do you mean, get rid of his legs? And then also, could you turn off gravity in the games engine? Because, and everyone who knows who makes games was like, you don't turn off gravity. Gra gravity is the thing that makes this believable in a games engine. And it took us a few weeks, but actually we did that. And as you can see, what Ariel turned into in terms of a puppet was this beautiful series of particles that, that again could transform. And it just now then needed an actor called Mark Courtley to play him. Mark is probably one of the most generous, brilliant actors there is. He took this gig on thinking that he would be performing in a motion capture suit like this, substage, no one would ever see him, and all you'd see is that. That's, why, that's how he took the gig. Actually, what happened was the technology was moving so quickly over the two years that we were making this piece. It transformed. And what's great about theatre is because we are rehearsing, rehearsing, iterating, and the, when we lock it down as press night, we had this huge opportunity to go with the technology and how the technology was developing so quickly along us. And that's not the same as film or television, where you get proof of concept and execute. And I think that's one of the real strengths of the technology um, in the theatre space. So what you can see here is Mark is wearing a, a face rig and then an optical tracking um, motion capture suit. Um, we just call them ping pong balls. And they have cameras that infrared read a message from Mark's suit. 
what was phenomenal in the time that we were making this is that we didn't need the optical tracking anymore. Actually, what we used was gyroscopic tracking, and Mark had 17 sensors on him tracking his movements. Um, the gyroscopic sensor is what you have in your mobile phone that tracks where you are in your GPS. And for a Wi-Fi system, we were able to make Mark look like this. And inside Mark's incredibly tight costume, there are 17 sensors. And not only that, he had the full width of the stage and it made sense because you could see the puppetry come alive. You could see Mark and you could see his avatar. So then we could, were able to create rules around the play and Shakespeare's text to make sense of that. Um, the, he performed this piece 150 times and I can tell you now from the start to the end of the run in London, he basically worked and moved and became more and more athletic and more confident with this technology and more confident in how he performed it. And by the end of it, it was a radically different performance of his, um, yet keeping the core values of the play. But something we're really proud of here is, I think, that we were able to make it make sense for theatre. And going back to how we made the rules, then the digital avatar only appeared according to the the text in the play, which was when uh, Ariel transformed, uh, when Ariel was angry, when Ariel was um, being caught up, uh, being naughty, and it just made sense for the audience, rather than having a technology come into this space without any of the rules and the reasons and the authenticity to make that happen. And this is my most favourite scene in the play because this could only be theatre. What's wonderful about this is you see Simon Russell Beale playing Prospero and what he's doing in this scene is reminding Ariel that if he is misbehaves he will get caught stuck back in the cloven pine that he has been stuck in for for, for years and he's reminding him of his, of, of his power but what's wonderful is you see Mark here um, as his human self and then his avatar this beautiful avatar, 40 foot high, and you can't, obviously you can't see it move or hear it, but what happens is the, the sound of a tree, tree roots and leaves constricting over him, absolutely suffocating him, the power of this, and then the projection mapping across the entire stage could only happen as a piece of theatre, and then suddenly it's gone, disappears. And that is what theatre is, and that's what makes it wonderful. And it's that rigour and convergence and that bringing in those new technologies to know why. And we cut a huge amount. It looked spectacular, but it wasn't right. It didn't work for the play, and it didn't move the play forward. And that's what we would do with any process. So what you see there is you see we didn't just use one form of motion capture technology. We used two converging um, with 27 projectors and projection mapping on stage, an absolute convergence of those new technologies, but through the storytelling is how we made the decisions. But one of the other things we needed to do was make sure that our audiences were connecting with this play. We were doing something really different. We were working with a technology company. It was a genuine collaboration. It was equal billing. And we wanted to bring new audiences into, into this space. Um, and I'm really proud to say that we had um, so many different generations of people get this play for different reasons. Our core audience, which is an older audience, came in with the Shakespeare and out with the spectacle of the technology. But if I asked any young people what their favourite scene was in this performance, they would say the drinking scenes with Stefano and Trinkolo. And there's no technology in those scenes. It's just people talking about drinking and being silly and jokes. And that's the Shakespeare. And that's the wonderful bit. And so what I love is that people came in with the technology and out with the Shakespeare in a generation that may not think Shakespeare's for them. But not only that, they found the humour and they found the joy and they found the heart of this piece. There was so much soul in this piece, a huge amount of technology, but there was a huge amount of humanity in a play that is about a father and forgiveness and setting things right. And I think that's the trick to it, is that we never showcased this going, wow, look, this is amazing. It had to, had to stand up to that play. 
So when we were bringing these audiences in, as you saw in the first slide, we have a thousand people have a shared experience every night, like we're having now. It's real, it's visceral. You'll all go away having your own opinion of, of how the day's gone, but we've shared something together. We'll talk about it. And uh, yeah, it's a deep and meaningful experience if you want it to be. And then we had to share it in an online space. And that was really interesting because we had to let these audiences know that we were doing something different. And for one day only, we did a Snapchat filter. And I can tell you now, I am not the audience for a Snapchat filter. I have no idea what I'm doing. But it was an audience that we wanted to connect with. And so we put, some, we put the design of Ariel on a filter, as you can see up there. And you could aerialize your face. You could become Ariel. For one day only UK, we reached 7.5 million people. That's a phenomenal amount of people for one day. And it's a phenomenal amount of people for a theatre company to connect with. And one of the big learnings from us is how do we create a connection with this brilliant actor and this world out there that are talking about that. And one of the learnings that we've had, it's not just the stage technology that we're talking about, it's the world of which we're in, and it's the world of the technology we're in. And so one of the big learning outcomes for us is how do we make those meeting points much better, much clearer, and how do we connect more meaningfully with that 7.5 million people to get... How can theatre hold those spaces better? And how do we make Prospero's Island be a place where you want to be transformed? And how do we go back to those young people who thought those drinking scenes were the best... How do we go back to them? How do we connect with them? And how do we use these new technologies to be inclusive? Because for every technology revolution there is, there is an, an inequity. Things will go faster, people will be successful, and it's who gets left behind in those revolutions that we need to be really conscious of, and that we mustn't create a new disenfranchised voice, and we mustn't make this feel complicated or different or difficult. And so when we look at an older generation, it is about the authenticity. And when we look about the younger generation, it's about an inclusivity and a welcome to a world that they'll feel comfortable with. And just to finish, I think um, this play was about looking back, looking back on 400 years of Shakespeare's works and writings and how these plays have been performed. But it was also about looking at the future and it was extending a theatre-making toolkit. At the RSC, we're not about just bringing in new technology. The best technology there is, is an actor. I've not seen an act anything better than an actor make you cry, make you laugh, and I think that's a wonderful thing to celebrate. But what we're really about is the cur curiosity around what new technologies can do to extend an already brilliant theatre-making toolkit. How can we enable actors, how we can enable production teams to tell those stories which are really robust and have lived with us for a long time, but tell them in a way that resonates for audiences now. And it's been great to be here and thank you very much for listening.